Flawcast episode 150, The Plot to Kill Christianity. We can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy is when men are afraid of the light. Plato. Flawcast. Get in the arena. Hello, esteemed, beautiful, fantastic Flawcast listeners, Flawcast Nation. I want to welcome and thank everybody for tuning in another week uh, to hear us uh, pontificate on all sorts of subjects. And uh, as always, I do want to welcome my partner in crime, Mr. Carl Tuckerson. Carl, it is so good to see you, my friend. Well... How are you, Mr. William? You're looking wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I feel a little under the weather, but if, I guess if I were any better, there'd be two of me. Well, don't let them know by the way you look how you feel, and you've achieved it. So, <laughs> but it's you. great to be here. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Um, we want to thank our esteemed listeners. Uh, I want to talk about, real quick, we had a couple episodes, Boundaries, and then also the Back to Basics that people have been really kind of commenting on, and we welcome that. We encourage that. We are not... a uh, people that don't want to hear what people think or opinions or thoughts. So please make sure you reach out to us. I'm going to give you all that information in a second, but uh, we really are just in a point where we're just seeing a lot of things happening and going back to basics and understanding where we are at, it, I think is just so important. So I want to thank everybody for listening and I want to ask you to share. We don't ask for anything. We don't have a Patreon. We don't have a bright star. We don't have anything that we ask for money. We are not a 501 C three. We're not a church per se, uh, but we are just trying to authentically live our lives and give you guys what we feel God is giving to us. What we are asking is you share that we want this message that the message of Christ in this generation to go out and to really impact people in in a way that might be confrontational, but that is necessary. And you can do that by sharing our episodes where anywhere podcasts are flawed cast CLE is what you want to search out. We're on Apple. We're on Google play, Spotify breaker. We're also on anchor.fm. You can find us on Rumble under Flawed Inc. Uh, we're also on the Project Mockingbird social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're on Gab. We're on Parlor and Getter as well. All under Flawed Inc. There is a link below to get a copy of my book, Smith's Heart of Man Repair Manual. If you haven't got that yet, I'd ask that you do and uh, read it and enjoy it and buy a couple copies for your friends. <laughs> uh, I'm working on my new book. Got a little more progress done this week, so I'm super excited about that. Our email is flawedincle at gmail.com. Send Carl an email there, and he'll he'll respond. And <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, we're going to get into Carl's second favorite time of the episode right now. All right. Please take your right hand, place it over your left heart, and repeat after us. I I pledge allegiance allegiance to the flag of the United States States of America America and and to to the republic Republic for which it stands, one one nation under God, indivisible, with with liberty and justice for all. All right, so I uh, (laughs) I was talking to Carl a little bit ago, and I said, hey, have you ever heard of Alice Bailey? And Carl said, no. He said he had not heard of her. So I, I wanted to kind of, as I do these little episodes, I do, I find these nuggets. I want to give people some information. The reason we're calling this the plot to kill Christianity is because there has been a plot, a long seated, a long purposed and worked plot to demoralize and de-spiritualize and when I say de-spiritualize I want to be very specific de-Jesus-fy if that's even a word I can make it is now it is now thank you our nation so I'm going to read a little bit here and I'm going to I'm going to turn over to Carl in a moment and let him read um but Alice Bailey uh she is known as one of the one of the founders of the new age movement uh spiritualism uh, there's a lot going on about that yoga, new age, all that kind of stuff. She was a writer who lived between 1880 and 1949. And she is the person who is known for creating the term quote unquote new age in her books, which mostly focus on the subject of theosophy. So that's kind of a 
that were there is a convergence of theology and philosophy. And it says uh, the Britannica describes theosophy as a occult movement originating in the 19th century with roots that can be traced to ancient Gnosticism. The term theosophy is defined from the Greek theos, God, and Sophia, wisdom. It is generally understood to mean divine wisdom. The international new age movement originated among independent theosophical groups. That's hard to say. Yep. Um, Alice Bailey is known as one of the prophetesses of the New Age movement. Her teaching and writings are viewed as foundational and authoritative within the New Age movement. She describes the majority of her work as having been telepathically dictated to her by a master of wisdom or a spirit entity identifying as... The Wall Cole. I don't know if I pronounced that right. I hope I didn't. I don't even like to have that uttered in my office here. Alice Bailey's writings are so revered and authoritative to such an extent that her New Age views and philosophies have a social, spiritual, and political impact on politicians, various nations, and also the United Nation. Alice Bailey, who founded the Lucis Trust, which was formerly known as the Lucifer Publishing Company in 1922, and it is believed her organization may have influenced the United Nations. One of the main agendas of the New Age movement is to become the dominant religion or lifestyle within the entire world. Therefore, in order for New Age philosophies to become dominant, when all other religions, especially Christianity, must either be destroyed or become less of a spiritual influence within society and in the individual lives of people, it is from the desire to see the dominance of the New Age movement that Alice Bailey wrote a 10-point plan slash charter to destroy Christianity so that the New Age philosophies may become the one world religion for the entire, for the entire world. Now, before we get into the 10 points, there, there's a lot there I can expound on, but I'm, I really want to hear your thoughts, Carl. Well, I think... As we've said so many times, this is a very well-insulated, very long-established time period that we're living in. I mean, we have went over organizations. We have went over institutions. We have covered everything that you could possibly cover as far as the issuing in of the Antichrist spirit and the killing and watering down of Christianity. Mm-hmm. We have done that now for well over a year together. Well, it's 150th episode, which, by the way, thank you guys for journeying oh, with us well, so there far. You go. Yeah, you know, so go ahead. Please continue. But when you look at when this started, when this was put together, and you realize we're talking over a hundred years here where this plan has been originated and now infiltrated. It's been propped up. It's been supported. And we're, uh, we're, I don't even want to say we're exposing it like this is some kind of new thing, but we are giving attention to it. And I think as we get into these 10 points that Alice wrote, to destroy Christianity and prop up a new world religion, one world religion, a unified religion. I think when we see the 10 points that was introduced in her writings close to or, or over a hundred years ago, we're going to be shocked at what has been accomplished in 100 years. Absolutely. And, which, by the way, 100 years in the grand scheme of time is a mere drop in the bucket. Absolutely. Um, I want you to go over the 10 things, Carl, but the, the things I wanted to take note of specifically were her belief that she telepathically received these 10 things from a, a master, you know? So, um, 
we've talked extensively how the devil is not a creator but an imitator and how i take that is when like for example carl and i i know because we've talked Every week, we're like, God, do you have something you want us to talk about? What What is on your heart that you want us to share with people? And we, whatever means that Holy Spirit speaks to us, that's what we do. And we do our best to transcribe that to everybody listening. She is doing the exact same thing, but in the opposite manner where she's accrediting a demon for speaking these demonic things to her. And the other thing that, you know, we talk about the um, episodes of, over a hundred episodes ago, I believe we talked about the creation of the um, NATO, the United Nations, uh, all these one organizations created to usher in the one world government, this antichrist Luciferian governmental system. And it's just so funny how the United Nations are so influenced by her plan and not just in america but globally you can see how most of the countries of the world other than america are so far down the line with these 10 points so uh carl uh grip yep. and rip it man. i will i just wanted to interject real quickly yes that i think in studying for this episode the one thing that I kind of learned, learned, we have spent a lot of podcast going over the specific time periods in history where the League of Nations, the League of Foreign Affairs, the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, mm -hmm. uh, United Nations. We went over all of it. Right. And I could continue. But how they always pick a time period to introduce after a world tragedy, a world event, where mm -hmm. they come in, they swoop in, and they put in another organization that says, we're never going to let this happen again. Right. We're never going to let that happen again. They did it after World War One, after World War Two. They always pick time periods where people are devastated, people are beaten down, people are fearful, people are afraid, right? Mm -hmm. And they come in with another prop to put the antichrist the devil and the spirit of the antichrist at the forefront and what i realized in studying this i believe that this woman alice bailey who i never i'm shocked i never heard of you're welcome. But thank you for introducing <laughs> her to me. That's what I do. I find these weird obscure hidden in plain sight things that and just expose them. Yeah. yeah. So what i saw was we could almost trace back to when the demon gave her the counterfeit Ten Commandments. Notice how there weren't nine and there weren't 11, but right. there were 10 points. Isn't mm -hmm. that ironic? But the point is, if you trace the time period of when this came in, all of these organizations and institutions that we've covered come after that. Well, this is almost foundationally the rock that everything we've covered is sat upon. Mm -hmm. And when you put it together intelligently and you look at this logically, this is another piece of the puzzle that you've brought to the table with me because I am seeing all of these events we've already covered. They're all leading back to this. Mm -hmm. This is the bedrock. Yeah. 1922. And and we you know like you said the the um, the League of Foreign Nations all all these things are created within five years after World War Two ended so and that certainly is that time span you're talking about so that's a great point for thank you for bringing that up all right shall we get into the ten points sure we we shall Christianity or to convert the nations to new age philosophies. The Alice Bailey 10-point plan is also part of a larger strategy to eventually introduce a new world order system. The 10-point charter by Alice Bailey is as follows. Take God and prayer out of the education system. Reduce parental authority over the children. Destroy the judo-Christianity... Destroy the judo-Christian family structure or the traditional Christian family structure. If sex is free, then make abortion legal and make it easy. Make a divorce easy and legal. Free people from the concept of marriage for life. Make homosexuality an alternative lifestyle. Debase art. 
make it run bad. Use media to promote and change mindsets. Create an interfaith movement. Get governments to make all these law and get the church to endorse these changes. I think number 10 right there, and then I'm going to turn you loose like a lion. <laughs> number 10 is the directive right there. As like, I brought out that puzzle piece that you brought to the table. Mm -hmm. With number 10, when she puts that we need to get the government to make all these law and get the church to endorse these changes, the government making law, honestly, that is why. I feel all of those institutions and organizations were put together. I think that is why they all were constructed, because there's no other way. And she's not just talking here, Mr. William, about making it law in America. She's no. basically global. talking about a global law. Affirmative. A, a universal global law. And when you have all of these world systems that have been infiltrated by this teaching, she has the vehicles to put in law these teachings. So I see this is a very eye-opening um, thing here. I'm, I'm actually, like, shocked that we have just stumbled upon this. It's good that we finally did. It, it's all making sense. Well, it, and the funny thing is, this is one of these things where I've kind of known about for a while, but I've just, just been not, keeping it a secret. Well, I've, I've, in being a, a student or a, a, an observer of observer of culture, you know, I, it's just the little things I notice with people that I don't know if a lot of people do. And, you know, I'll give you an example. Like, just driving around like my wife and I the other day were just driving around people don't use their signals anymore people they don't understand the concept of you're on the road you need to share and cooperate it's it's just this kind of dog eat dog thing in a very hazardous way and and then you know even just just the overall behavior of people um are just starting to decline and I'm like you know what I see that as a direct result of the Spirit of God being slowly lifted and removed from our society. And what I mean by that, not that God has withdrawn His Spirit, but people are not walking in harmony and unity with the true Christ and, and with His Spirit. And there is a withdrawal of that in people where you know in in 1922 when these were introduced Carl these are some this is some radical radical thoughts she was way ahead of her time she was period. very very much ahead of her time and you know just to kind of go over some of these there there aren't any of these that aren't established now correct this is nomenclature to think that 101 years ago when these were published or these were brought out that so effectively and so institutionally grounded these points would be. And even, you know, I'm, I made a note on number nine where it says create an interfaith movement. You know, we talked about that in episode 138 with, with the Abrahamic family house, which is yes. in Abu Dhabi, where, you know, the Christianity, Islam, and Judaism is now converging into this conglomerate of the Abrahamic faith. Right. Uh, and, and they all have that common bond. Um, the, the reality of it is, is Christ is Lord. Right. Islam and Judaism refuse to acknowledge and submit to his authority and his lordship. But as we are progressing in this timeline... What is becoming more and more apparent to me isn't the behavior of people who don't have a relationship and don't engage with the Holy Spirit on a regular basis. It's the people that claim to that I'm I'm really genuinely wrestling with because you know a, a lot of these things. You know, take God in prayer now. The educational system, number one. I, I mean that. Uh, you know, I, I graduated in the in the mid '90s. You know, at that point, I can tell you that we still did the Pledge of Allegiance, right. and and um, I don't think that even happens anymore. But what I can tell you is. Even was almost you know twenty eight however many you know twenty seven twenty eight years ago however long that was 
since that time till now, that's it, it just doesn't it doesn't exist any longer. It's not, you know, it's been completely removed. Um, you know, reducing parental authority over children. We just saw through through COVID, children were removed from people's houses who didn't want their children to have these vaccinations. And and Karl Marx. In Marxism, they actually believe and promote, which ties into this, that children are property of the state, not of the individual parents. Um, you know, and just coming to go, uh, destroying the Judeo Christian family structure for the traditional Christian family structure, you, you know, now the norm is a single parent family um, with, right. with multiple. When you say norm, what you mean is above 50% for the first time in history. Correct. Correct. And, and you know, you can't blame the kids for that. No. That's not, that's not a, ch- a child's fault. But what it is, it's ha- having, I'm going to say this, this is not a race-based statement. Because I just read an article the other day where uh, there was a white lady who had six different children by six different fathers. And in this, they were asking her, well, why do you have so so many kids from so many fathers? And she says, "Well, if I had six kids from one father, I would only get three hundred and forty dollars total per month from that father. But I have six fathers, different children. I get three hundred and forty dollars a month from all of them. So she gets three hundred and forty dollars a month for, and, and that's all she does. Wow. Even the whole idea of masculinity in that regard has been removed." And even starting when I was a a child, you know, there were more and more single parent and usually, usually not always, but usually the single parent is the mother, you know, and God designed children, whether they be a, a, a boy or a girl, that there are attributes from both a mom and a dad that both children, whether it be male or female, need as they're growing up, and we're seeing that there's a lack of that, and we, in, in, in that we are seeing the repercussions of that in society. We're seeing um, incarceration rates increase because usually there's not a strong father figure. We're seeing uh, prostitution and drug rate, uh, uh, drug abuse climb because of that same thing. It is a, a vicious cycle, you know. And just going through this, um, if sex is free, make abortion legal and make it easy. You know, the whole idea of abstinence or even, you know, once again, when I was growing up, not to sound like that angry, bitter old dude, but it's like, I remember, you know, we, we used to talk about, you know, if you're going on a date, make sure you had your Jimmy hat. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, and that might, if you guys don't know what that is, Google that. But, um, you know, you, you got to take your raincoat or, you know, whatever um, euphemisms that you want to use. But basically, uh, you know, it's contraceptive. Um, you know, abstinence is, a, is 100% effective. Uh, other, uh, well, yeah, right? because, see, they use abortion in teaching as now the same approach as prevention. So what I mean, you're talking about no, contraceptives, I we talk about birth control, we talk about, you know, the pill, we talk about from a male perspective and a female perspective of, you know, being smart, being wise, being cautious, abstinence is the guaranteed way to not have uh, children, we go through all that. But some time period, and I, I'm not quite sure when it was, they have transitioned the a procedure of abortion into the same category as the pill. And they have devalued human life and the fact that that isn't even human life by saying abortion is now prevention. And it's not. They're two totally different things. Absolutely. And, and going and bringing even more of a spiritual connotation, because that's all this, this is, you know, the, the Church of Satan, There, when the Supreme Court last year overruled the federal mandate on abortion and they kicked it back down to the state level, the Church of Satan filed an appeal because they look at it and look this up if you don't believe me. This is a sacrifice, a sacrament unto their God. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and they're, It's almost like the practice of sacrifice to Moloch. Well, and that's what I was going to say. And, and, you, and in Baal worship and Moloch, which we now see, you know, Jeffrey, you know, Epstein Island and all this stuff, right. all these pedo, not disgusting, vile stuff is coming out. And we see that these ancient Babylonian 
gods with a little g that were sacrificed to is now becoming more predominant into society. But basically all this is, is this is ritualistic killings offering up to Baal and Malik who effectively are just different names for Lucifer. Disguised in the form of prevention. Exactly. No matter how we, meaning humanity, culture, whatever country is listening to us right now, no matter how we view it or what we call it, abort, abortion, prevention, whatever, um, Satan doesn't care what you call it as long as you do the it. act is done. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, I just feel like... Reading? Well, here, I'll, go ahead. I'll just keep going. Um, make the make divorce easy and legal. Listen, I, Carl and I have both been through divorces. There's nothing easy about them. However, I think it's talking about the stigma you know, it's a good point. Now people are on three, four, five, six. You know, I, I just recently read an article about a woman that was divorced seven times. Wow! And she's made a career of it. Well, right. And in marriage, there are tough times. Like it's not, you know, quote Saint Stallone, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. But that covenant that you make between your partner and and God is something that has been eroded and deteriorated. And literally, people walk around, whether they visibly or uh, invisibly wear it, there's nothing easy about divorce because you lose pieces of you along the way. And it just it's another step in demoralizing people. Here's one. Debase art and make it mad. And let me tell you something. I, you're going to laugh because I, I just, probably will because it's coming out of your mouth. Exactly. Um you, we live in Cleveland, and there are certain neighborhoods that if you drive through in Cleveland, you want to make sure your doors are locked and your yeah. windows are up. However, if you notice the architecture in those neighborhoods, they're, it's beautiful. Or, it or you can picture at one time, it was beautiful. Billionaire's in, Row, man. Exactly. Where Rockefellers used oh, to live. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you can see, at one point, it was ornate. It was unique. It was individual. It and it was just there was craftsmanship and pride. In and this came out in the church reports, and you can go find this. This is a fact. The CIA came up with a plan in the fifties and sixties to make modern architecture and modern art ugly and simple and debased. And think about this, Carl. Look at the neighborhoods we're just talking about. And I'm sure who, wherever you're listening, you you have neighborhoods that are probably a little more run down, but the architecture is just gorgeous. And you're like, wow, I bet back when that was made, this was, you know, whatever. So whereas now you drive around a neighborhood that may have been the equivalent back then, everything, you know, it, the appearance of being safe and clean, but it's all cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. It's ugly colors. It's the same design in these, you know, you got a foot and a half space from your neighbor. And, and it's just, this is made to debase and to humiliate us, to make us depressed. Art by design is supposed to uplift the human spirit. Well, you know, art and, supposedly, and I'm not an art major, it comes from inspiration. Right. Art is supposed to inspire whoever and, looks and whoever does. And that's why I I mean with my business I've had to deal with very eccentric people. <laughs> very weird. I'm sure. But I mean extremely weird, artsy. But that inspiration that comes through their work, if that work doesn't exist or if everything is stereotypical plain now like like you just said right you lose your inspiration because when you look at a painting what looks inspirational to you may look like a bunch of scribbly different colored lines to me right but it's what inspires you and it's what inspires me and if they kill inspiration and if they kill the spirit then they become empowered 
to keep you killed, to and, keep you dead. And, and art isn't just contained to pictures. It's contained to all. literature. It pertains to music. It pertains to movies or theater or, uh, you, you know, like anything. And you can look if you know, I, I'm, I like film. I like literature. You can, you can read modern novels, you know, in comparison to something like Shakespeare, these are just simple observances, and once again, you can look through the church reports and CIA in the 60s, but architecture, just using that example, was there was a plot to make what was new ugly and depressing and boxy and simplistic versus, like, you look at like a Frank Lloyd Wright or one of his houses or designs or even, like I said, even like turn of the century houses, they're just sure. so ornate. And that's just one example. Um, use media to promote and change mindsets. I don't even think we need to get into that. Um, you know, create an interfaith movement. We talked about that. Um, and then, you know, the government and this governmental system has to be established on a global setting, which the antichrist system would not be permitted to operate if it doesn't you know if it's just like hey england's just going to do this thing and the rest of the world's going to do their own thing it's just not going to work um that's why i I personally you know and i i I might be wrong and if i'm wrong i I actually kind of hope i'm wrong but you know i really feel like you know america the position that we're in is we're in our death throes I, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I, it, it looks very apparent to me that there's forces that want us to be in our final hour. Well, and, they are, and it really is something that I've come to accept. That is, what do I individually and personally do with the time left in my life mm-hmm. to not necessarily change the outcome of time, but to kind of hold off events. <laughs> right. Kind of like, uh, you know, hold the fort till Jesus comes type uh, thing. I talked about that song in the church hymnal on right. our, one of our podcasts. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like uh, Custer's Last Stand. The Anything Alamo. You c- the, the Alamo. The Alamo. Yeah. It's almost like I'm not upset or angry or mad anymore like I was before I started this therapy project called Flawedcast. <laughs> this podcast has really helped me um, not laying on the couch, but to sit in the therapeutic chair and to in the beginning, if you go back to when I joined, I think you can almost see that all Carl was really doing was just venting. It was like almost like a, a anger aggression. And I have made it through many podcasts and through the process of this i have realized i don't need to be as angry as i was when i started this whole thing i just need to battle my station man at my station be at battle do what i do right to the best of my ability to the glory of god be faithful to the call be faithful to the stand and it's Not up to me to change the outcome. It's up to me that until the outcome happens, whether that's me drawing my last breath or whether that's God saying, go get them. What? Go get them, son. (laughs) Get on that horse and bring them home. It's time. Right. Right? And until that time, I really think that if we can just all be inspired by knowing This is pretty much toe the line, hold the fort, make the stand, and let's do the best we can with where we are. And I really uh, feel good about doing that. I feel inspired. You know how we talked about art and inspiration. I feel inspired about the approach in these terrible times we're heading in with the quote dickens it was the best of times it was the worst of times and my purview as much as i'm able to as much as i'm cognitively aware of is not just to survive but to piss off the enemy right. as much as possible right um, shout out to our buddy tommy you know he I was talking the other day about something like, yeah, just struggling with this or that. He goes, man, why would you not think that you wouldn't be struggling? He's like, you're, you're exposing satanic mindsets in your podcast. You're telling people that Christ is the only way to heaven. You're, you're proclaiming these things that 
aren't being taught and heard in most churches, of course you're going to get, you know, uh, you're going to have a fight. But, and, and once he said that, it, it kind of, oh, yeah, I asked for this. Yeah, but you know what and, the thing is, Mr. William, you're so right, but we're already getting our asses handed to us anyway. Well, right. And that's where I'm, I'm like, that's what I'm saying. I'm with you. Well, I'd right? rather enjoy it because really this is the only time that we get to of our own omission and our own will say, I'm going to stand in defiance, whatever it costs me, of mm-hmm. this evil. I will not capitulate. I will not bend a knee. I will not toe the line. Because you can't. There, no. there, is, there is no cohabitation with the type of evil well, that we're referring to. It just isn't. Because, no. because the... the, the, the Lucifer, the devil himself, who inspired Alice Bailey and, and legions of others to put these demonic anti-Christ systems in place, they come to take over. They don't come to cohabitate. They don't come to share. They don't come to um, barter or bargain. And where we are at, and I had a conversation with someone this weekend, uh, you know, and we we're talking about revival and this and that and you know I, I i'm my purview on this stuff is simply this it will bear fruit if it's of god it will bear fruit it will bear godly fruit and i sure. feel like and i feel like what we are seeing is that we are at this time where we can make the choice am i going to serve god or am i going to serve evil in, well, we're being forced now to make that. Choice. Well, it's becoming very blatant. Absolutely, and and I, I agree. And my encouragement is serve God. Yeah, and in serving God, do what you can do to cause as much disruption, as much um, havoc, ha- havoc. Yes, as as much uh, confounding um, that you can to the kingdom of darkness because. We get to win ultimately, but I believe this is the charge that God has given us. Many are called, but the chosen are few. So what does that mean? To me, what that means is like people that know me, they know I, I have like eight different alarms on my phone for different things. And I have yeah. one I have one set every night at 938. And the reason I do that is and most nights I just hit you know, stop. I don't think about it, but a lot of nights I do. I stop and I pray Matthew nine thirty eight, and Matthew nine thirty seven thirty eight. It's Jesus talking to his disciples, and he says, "Then he, Jesus, said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field." Christ didn't say, "Pray for." the people that need to get saved he did and we should but he is encouraging the very people who he is commissioning directly at that time in history to go out and to spread his message he's saying listen pray for the people that are going to go out in those harvest fields that are going to spiritually combat these demonic forces that people like alice bailey or um Aleister Crowley or Anton LaVey or, uh, you know, Noah Harari or Bill Gates or whomever we want to add to that list now, who they are working with, who they are capitulating with, and pray for the people that are going to stand in defiance of their evil and in alignment with the cross of Christ. We need to start praying for those people. And you know what? We have the ability to be those people. And my response when I had the conversation about the revival is revival can happen in Kentucky. Revival can happen in Florida. It can happen in California. But it can also happen in your house. It can happen in your church. It can happen in your car. It can happen anywhere that you make room for God and you allow him to come and clean you and do that work to revive your spirit, to stoke those fires in your heart. So... All I'm saying is, like, now we get to fight for a a cause that's worth something. You know, there's so many causes out there. You know, save the dogs. And I like dogs, so save dogs. Um, You know, save the rainforest. Save the dolphins. Save the whales. You know, whatever. Save the... I don't know. And those are great. Do that. 
but the cause that we can now fight for is to do as much damage to the kingdom of darkness by expanding God's kingdom. I like your thinking, Mr. William, and we can go all the way back to Israel coming out of Egypt and then sending a reconnaissance mission of men to view their land and see what was waiting for them. All throughout the battles of history and war, all throughout the time of history, reconnaissance missions have been so important. Fact gathering, information gathering, sending in the spies, knowing who and what you're fighting against, knowing the layout of where you're going, knowing what's waiting for you. So what we have done in this podcast here, if I may, Hmm. is we have exposed a foundational truth that is this time period we're in didn't happen overnight. It wasn't orchestrated overnight. It didn't manifest overnight. It's been happening over time. It didn't happen by chance. So everything we're going through right now was no accident. It was planned. It has been planned for a long time. It has infiltrated a lot of places. We are telling people right now the truth. We are doing the work that they don't have to do. We're doing the research. We're doing the reading. We're doing the praying about this. I know a lot of people pray about a lot of things, but specifically what we're praying for is God show me so we can talk to them. Mm-hmm. Is that That's how I prepare Absolutely. for the podcast is God show me. Right. What do I need to do? What would you like to do through me so then I will speak to them, whoever them is, whether it's family, friends, or foe? And you're so right. Take the fight spiritually that we don't fight against flesh and blood. That's not our battle. Okay? That's not where our focus is. But if we give information like spies that have went ahead and we have seen what is happening now, and then we go back like we've done, even in this episode, and we trace where where the origin was, we have now put together a pretty clear and accurate timeline of 120 years ago to now. We see every single thing that was talked about then already not talked about, but introduced and in operation. So we are getting, like, like I said earlier, our butts handed to us on a silver platter. And it's time to quit sitting back and allowing it to happen and be safe and secure in the salvation and forgiveness of sins that we have. We are a moment away from the devil to unleash his next attack against us. So why in the world would we not go on the attack? You know, you're right. I'm feeling this inside me at this point in my life that says to heck with trying to not stir the hornet's nest up because I know that if he could, the devil would wipe me out right now. That's how much hate and indignation he has for not only me, but for all of us, but he knows he can't. And so I must repay my heavenly father who has put that bloodline around me that protects me from the attacks that satan would throw and the annihilation of my existence that he would do if he could i must repay jesus for what he did for me on the cross by giving him my best in the time period that i live and he just so happens to speak to me and show me and the holy spirit shows us these things so we must bring them forth it's what we are obligated to do for what he did for us you know we're both loyal guys that's one of the biggest things we talk about we show we exhibit is that loyalty thing. Right. And so, like, if somebody dies for me, man, I... That's a big thing. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if it's somebody... It's not a little just, thing. If somebody just takes a hit. Right. If somebody just has my back and I'm not there in the room and they're defending my honor, that's a big thing for me. But knowing that somebody laid their life down for me the way 
Jesus made me with my outlook and my personality. He has so committed me to his cause by how he created and crafted me because what he did for me means so much more than my words can describe. So I can't use my words. I have to give my life. It Does that make sense? Words don't do justice to the loyalty he showed to me. So I can't well, just say thank you. What he did was more than words. It was action. Yeah. I, I want to say this in closing. You talk about art. I like reading. I like literature. There's a little book called The Count of Monte Cristo by a gentleman named Alexander Dumas. Who, yeah, just a little book. Yeah, who actually it's wrote. It's very well known, Mr. William. It, I, well, he, I hope it is. You'd be surprised. But uh, he also wrote The Three Musketeers, too, if you don't know who they are. But um, this is one of my favorite quotes from that book and uh I, we've talked about it before in the podcast i'm just going to say it because i just feel like this is a time to inspire and i this inspires me life is a storm my young friend you will bask in the sunlight one moment be shattered on the rocks the next what makes you a man is what you do when the storm comes you must look at the storm and shout as you did in rome do your worst for i will do mine and I feel in my spirit as reverently to Christ and as defiantly to the devil in, in knowing what repercussions there may be to say, do your worst. For through me, Christ will do his best. And I think that's a good place to end this. Um, I hope you're inspired. That's the whole point of this. Uh, you know, we want to be counterculture to the counterculture, and uh, we want to really inspire everybody. Um, and make sure you share this. I, I feel super pumped, super inspired right now. Um, I might go do a push up. I don't know, but. Um, <laughs> Um, make sure you share this or anywhere you can listen to podcasts, Flawcast, CLE, Apple, Google Play, Spotify, Breaker, Anchor.fm. We're on Rumble under Flawed Inc. We're on the Project Mockingbird social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, we're on Parlor, Getter, and Gab, all under Flawed Inc. There's a link below to get a copy of my book, Smith's Heart of Man Repair Manual. I'll also put a link below to this article if you want to read up more about this witch, basically. Um... And I just want to encourage you once again, do your worst and Christ will do his best through you. 